I think we're, Mark's always my like double checker on that. I think we're good there. Um, well, good, good morning. And, and if you're catching this on video, we are really glad that you would uh, join us. And, and we hope our messages are encouraging you. We're actually seeing more impact uh, online. So sort of our presence is growing. People are getting, uh, people are following us. In fact, one of the people that the outreach, she can't go to church. And she was like, do you guys put your church online? And they were like, we sure do. We've got a YouTube channel. So like, there's some real, uh, you know, God's using those efforts to really extend the kingdom. One of the things that I would encourage us as a church is that, um, you know, we tend to think that our church is just who's sitting in our seats on Sunday. But one of the things that I've, you know, I, I grew up Catholic and when I was really young, uh, and one of, the, one of the things that I think maybe the Catholic Church had a good grasp of was they didn't see just who came to their Mass on Sunday as being their church. They thought of the community as their church. And so when you know, I think God is putting in our heart that it's not just who's here on a Sunday that, uh, that's a part of Crossway Vineyard, but as we reach out, and, um, whether it be on video or, or through our, um, our, our outreaches, that our understanding of how God wants to use us as a community will expand. So, um, so I would encourage you in that. We are starting a new series. Oh, those of you who do catch us online, I always want to say... Uh, we're in Urbana, Ohio, and if uh, you're looking for a church, we would love to have you. Just come and join us in person. I think we're a pretty good church, and we meet on Sundays at 10 a.m., and um, yeah. And, and if you're watching this from a, an area that's outside of Urbana, I would encourage you to, uh, if you're not a part of a local church, you know what, you're, you're, not, you're really not going to live out the life that Jesus has for you as a Lone Ranger Christian, you need to be a part of the body of Christ. So get into a church that loves Jesus, and you'll, you'll be good. But we're starting a new series. Uh, that we're gonna, it's going to be a shorter series, only a few weeks, and it's called Amazing Love. And, you know, I, uh, it's funny because we were, you know, had, uh, sort of the love has been the theme of the week, and all these love songs have been in my head. Like we came up with the name Seeds of Love, uh, you know, uh, for for their food ministry, and in my head, ever since, and now I'm dating myself, and this may be a little obscure, but in the eight, late 80s, there was a group called Tears for Fears. I don't know if anybody remembers Tears for Fears, and they had a song, Sowing the Seeds of Love, the Seeds of Love, Sowing the Seeds. Okay. Am I the only one? No. Wow. Vaguely. <laughs> So anyway, and then we're like praying in our, our, our holy huddle this morning, our pre-service prayer, and we're talking about love, and that that's going to be our, our theme for the next few weeks. And so, um, and um, I was talking about that, the seeds of love, and, and Susie came up with, the, with a song that was, uh, all you need is love. Do, 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 do. It's funny how you can, we can tell the eras we're from, right, by the, sound, by the songs that come to mind. But we love love, don't we? We love to hear love stories. We love to hear and sing love songs. You know, was it Paul McCartney in the Wings that said something about, oh, silly love songs. Like, people love love songs. And did you know that in America, we spent, get this, $26 billion on Valentine's Day this year in 2023. Twenty-six billion dollars. That's a lot of money on love. What's more, we all crave love. We'll do almost anything to get love if we don't have it, to know that we're loved by somebody else unconditionally. And also that we are able to give love, to express love to another person, unconditional love. Love is important in our life, and whatever, whether that means a spouse or a friend or a family member, love is super, super important. That's what I love about our grocery outreach teams. You know what? They're out giving groceries and like in meeting a felt need for folks, but what they're doing is um, they're demonstrating the love of Christ, and that's what makes the difference. People who 
I think uh, our, you know, I think we were talking about, I was talking to the team that went out yesterday, people who struggle with not being seen. All of a sudden, not only is a church seeing them, but what we're communicating is God sees you. Jesus sees you. He knows your need and he loves you. One of the, Shannon was telling me that one of the ladies was, uh, they, they went to her home and they said, you know, we want to give you groceries. And she, and she was like, well, sure. And she, and, and she, and she said, they're free. Like she was shocked. They're free. And they were like, yeah, they're for course. You know, we just want to let you know, God loves you. Jesus loves you. And she said, how did you know to come? Cause she really was like that day in need of groceries. She said, how did you know to come to my, my, my apartment, my home? Like, how did you know? And Shannon's like, well, as a team, we, we prayed that Jesus would send us to the places that he really wanted to meet needs today, and he sent us to your home. Powerful. It was a powerful demonstration of the kingdom. Love. It's a, it's a powerful thing to be loved. In America, there's an American psychiatrist. Um, oh, let me get my uh, starter thing. <laughs> Good idea. It doesn't work until I'm, unless I'm really doing it. So there's an American psychiatrist by the name of Carl Minninger, and he founded the Minninger Clinic in Houston, Texas. And he wanted to understand the origin of, of ills of his patients in, in his clinic that his staff were taking care of. And so he decided he would try a little experiment. He instructed his clinic staff to give his patients what he called generous amounts of creative love. Just love on our patients. Generous amounts of creative love. And he told them for six months, I don't want anyone coming to work with a bad attitude. You know, leave your, leave your, your troubles at home on, you know, for six months. No bad attitudes. Just come and love on the patients that you have the opportunity to care for. Give them big doses of creative love. And then he watched. And after six months, Carl Minninger noticed that the average time that the patients were in his clinic was cut by exactly one half. And afterwards, he said, love cures people. It cures both the ones who give it as well as the ones who receive it. Do you know that nobody knew that better than Jesus? right in the Bible. He demonstrated the love of the Father, the love of God uh, to a cross section of humanity during the days that he spent on earth. He loved the worst of sinners and he loved the best of saints. He loved lepers and prostitutes and young children. He loved older people, religious people, atheists. Jesus Christ showed the love of God in human flesh. And in these next few weeks, we're going to look at that cross-section, that amazing love, the ways that Jesus demonstrated love and changed the culture around him. We're going to unpack that as a church. We're going to look at some of the different approaches and encounters that Jesus had with people. But what I want to do is begin by focusing uh, just this morning on, on three foundational truths when it comes to the love of God. We're going to be in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. For those of you who have a Bible or device, we'll have it on the screen. We're going to look at Mark 10, verses 17 through 27. But Holy Spirit, I thank you for what you've already done, what you're already doing in this service with us today. And Jesus, I pray that whether uh, where it's folks here who are in person or those catching this online, uh, Holy Spirit, that you would make your word alive in our hearts. God, that your word, you would give us a hunger and a desire for truth that's found in your word, and that would lead us to uh, wanting more of your Holy Spirit. Would you come fill us, refresh us, renew us, and reveal to us the truths of your kingdom through your word. And I pray for other churches throughout Urbana and Champaign County that are worshiping you, Jesus. Would you encourage them? Would you fill them? Would you empower them for the work of your ministry? In Jesus' name. Amen. In Mark chapter 10, verse 17, we read, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do you call, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. 
You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell, he went away sad, because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With the man it's impossible, but with God, with God, all things are possible. The first truth is a simple truth that we find in this text is that Jesus loves people. Jesus loves people. Don't you know that? And sometimes the way he loves people can take us a little bit by surprise. Like when we think of love, we we think of kindness. Love should be kind, right? Love should be gentle. Love should be full of mercy. Love should be full of grace. But love also tells the truth when it's hard. Do you notice like in this scripture that we looked at, you know, Jesus is having this interaction with this uh, with this rich with the rich young ruler, with the rich young man. And he asks him, you know, um, teacher, all, I've kept all those commandments. In fact, I've kept them all since I was a boy, since I was young. Like, I've done everything right. Still not satisfied. There's still something more. The kingdom you're talking about feels um, a little distant from me. There's something more that with this young man, we know he struggled with being self-righteous. I've done it all. I've, I've, been, I've lived perfectly. Now notice this before Jesus kind of rebukes him and challenges him. It, the Bible says Jesus looked at him and loved him and then said the one thing you lack. Do you know love tells the truth? Love tells the truth, even when it's hard, right? There's nothing loving about like just being passive, you know, Jesus didn't say, I had a boy, good job. You did a really wonderful, you know, growing up. You're on the right path, just keep going what you're doing. Jesus loves him enough to tell him the truth. Even when it was hard, and even when it would, be, it would not be received. This young man who is different than Jesus Christ, not only was this young man a rich young ruler, um, you know, as he's often called throughout in the Bible in different um, accounts of scripture, but there are some real differences between uh, this young man and Jesus. First off, he didn't know what Jesus knew. He didn't know, he didn't understand the kingdom. And that's why he asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Another difference is that he was nowhere near the level of spirituality, obviously, that Jesus was. He recognized that Jesus was a teacher, good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life. A third thing to note is this young man was, again, pretty self-righteous. When people rattle off the commandment, when Jesus rattles off the commandment to him, he boldly asserted, I've kept all these from my, you know, from the time of my youth, ever since I was born, ever since I was a young boy, I've done the right things. And the fourth difference is this young man was gripped by the sin of greed and materialism. He trusted his own ambition for self-fulfillment more than Jesus. He trusted what he was able to obtain on his own was better and more fulfilling than what Jesus had to offer. And once confronted by Jesus, he doesn't respond favorably, does he? He actually walks away from Jesus. Now, even though all that is true, the Bible, the text plainly says, again, Jesus loved him. Jesus' love was not conditional. It wasn't based on the posture of this young man's heart, right? It wasn't based on whether it would be received or not. 
like Jesus loves a lot like ours, right? It's easy to love folks who, who, who receive it from you, right? Who reciprocate love, right? It's easy to love folks who love you back. But what about the ones who don't? What about the ones who don't? What about the ones who don't know how to love? What about the ones who are shut down? I mean, we, we all have family members, maybe friends, right? The ones who don't love you back, don't feel like they respect you. Those are the ones we're called to love, right? To be very intentional about. It's a agape love, isn't it? It's the Greek word agape. Unconditional, sacrificial love. It is the sacrificial love of the will. It is the intentionality of loving somebody who you feel doesn't deserve it. Agape love. No strings, unconditional. That's the kind of love that Jesus had towards the rich young ruler. Do you know that Jesus never met anybody that he didn't love? Do you know that? 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 says, God is love. It's so easy to say, it's so hard for us many, uh, that, you know, that God is love. It, it, we can toss that word around and sing about it. And it, what we find is it's a, it's a challenging thing for us, though, because it challenges us to love with the love of God, not just what we have on our own. I'm thinking about married couples. If it wasn't for the love of God that Shannon and I, through God's grace, you know, Jesus has been the center of, of our marriage, for most of our marriage, with the exception of the first six months. 20 years old, came to know Jesus. Jesus became the center of our life because I think he knew he got to get me young because I was going to really mess this thing up if I didn't. And he captured our hearts. But i got to be honest with you. Like, so we've, uh, we, you know, in July, we celebrated 33 years of being married. And, um, but it's not um, a love that's been sustained because of affection for one another. I would say we have grown in love. We love each other more today than we did back in 1990 when we got married. <laughs> But it's not because we've just gotten really good at it or because of the gifts we give to each other or maybe the affection grown with, you know, all those things you might think. It's because we have learned something about the grace of God for one another. Probably if we couldn't hold each other in grace and mercy, we probably wouldn't be married anymore. That has sustained and kept our relationship healthy. For married couples, that's my prayer for our church, that families we would grow in grace for one another, that we would hold each other in grace. That's why D.L. Moody, uh, he went on a uh, long search and he took this concordance. Back in those days, there was no internet, right? So there was, remember, the, do you guys still, anybody still have concordances on their, in their, on their bookshelves? We got a few out there. I mean, they were like really thick. Well, D.L. Moody took these concordances and he traced every single reference he could find in the Bible to the love of God. And afterward, he said, there is no truth in all the Bible that should affect us as much as the love of God. Jesus loves people. Secondly, Jesus loves people uniquely. Did you know that? Jesus loves people uniquely. What I find interesting about Jesus in this section of text that we're reading in chapter 10 of Mark, earlier in the chapter, Jesus picks up these children, he's playing with them, he blesses them, and there's this real tender encounter, tender engagement that Jesus has with kids, and he just blesses them. And then the very next chapter, he overturns tables in the temple and he drives out the worshipers and he rebukes them because he loved them. Still love, different expression. Loved people uniquely based on where they were at and what would redeem them, what they needed. He definitely approached people individually. One of the things that I love about God is that he never had a canned approach. He never had a canned approach to people. Have you noticed that? He never begins his encounter and engagement with people with like the same spiel, 
the same question. You know, I told you I got the spiel with my invitation cards. Hey, I'm kind of new in town. I don't tell them I've been every year. I'm kind of new in town, and I'm, you know, we're part of this great, great church. I think, I think you'd really like. That's what I tell people when I invite them to church. Uh, Jesus didn't have a spiel. He connected people with exactly where they were at and what their and where their felt need was. That's the heart of God. He didn't have a canned approach to people. I used to tell Shannon, um, I used to be against um, Hallmark. I used to be against like cards, like Valentine's Day cards. Cause I, and I would tell her, and I was sincere in this. Like It just felt weird going into a store and finding a card like, that said something. Right? Like, it just felt weird to me, like, to buy these words to give to my wife. I felt it would be more sincere if I wrote them on a piece of notebook paper <laughs> and then gave it to her, you know. And then I, what I learned is that, like, these cards really do mean something to Shannon. She's really into cards. So I, I've learned that for her to receive love, it's important that I get a decent card, not just a drawing on a piece of notebook. I did that, like, early in our marriage. I used to like go, hey, I'm not going to get you a car because, you know, I'm buying someone's words. You know, don't you want my own words? He's like, no, I want a nice card. <laughs> well, Jesus has a card for everybody, but inside the card are unique words written just for you and me. Jesus has this unique ability. Of course, he was God to know people's hearts. He knew their motives. He knew uh, that he was dealing with when he would approach somebody. He knew who they were. Like the woman uh, that was caught in adultery, if you remember that. He said, uh, I think that's in Luke chapter 8. Woman, where are your accusers? She said, sir, I have none. And Jesus replies, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So tender. But at the same time, offered her a trajectory in life that would bring health. Right? It was off challenge her to, to live a life that was changed. To the man, the leper who ostracized from who was from society and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Uh, now we know he was a leper, so nobody was allowed to even come near him, let alone touch him. Jesus touched him, and the Bible says, um, the man said, I am willing, be clean. Or Jesus prays for the man and heals him. Tender touch. That's what the man needed. Probably more than being healed of leprosy was the need for touch. The need for touch. Jesus knew his need, and he knew the man's unique felt needs and ministered to him right where he was at. On the other hand, we see the scribes and the Pharisees. He spoke to very harshly words like, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You are whitewashed tombs filled with dead man's bones and all corruption. Ouch! But you know what? Those are words of love. That's what people needed to hear. Jesus was offering hope, a different way, a different life. Very different than the woman called, you know, in adultery, his approach. He knew what people needed. Some people he called, you know, by name, like Mary Magdalene. After the resurrection, he says with a tender tone, Mary or, or Peter at the time, she, you know, he didn't call people by their, often by their first name. He made up names for them. Right? Peter. Simon Peter. There's another difference that we see. You know, again, he calls folks brood of vipers when he is out to correct and rebuke people. He walked up to uh, one day to Matthew, the tax collector, and publicly called him out and said, come and follow me, be my disciple, in front of everybody, in front of a crowd that had ostracized, that had ostracized Matthew. He knew what it would restore Matthew. He knew it. And in front of everybody, he said, hey, Matthew, we're going to your home, and we're going to have a lunch today. On another occasion, he cast out a demon to the Gadarene who begged Jesus to let him come and follow him after he's delivered. And Jesus said, no, you can't follow me. Go back home and tell your friends the good things that God has done. Different approaches to different people. And he does this all in front of the disciples who he's training and helping to develop because they're going to be the ones that are going to help to establish this thing we call church. 
Jesus loved people uniquely. Uniquely. Love has different expressions, right? Think about like if you're a parent or a grandparent, the way we love our kids. Now, there is something, though, that happens with, with a grandparent. Like, it's really different. than I always heard this was true. Like, you know, the grandparents would say, we love being grandparents because we get all the fun stuff with the kids and then we send them home, you know, that kind of a thing. And, and, and so anyway, the way we love as parents, right, uh, on one hand, we can give our, our kids birthday presents, gifts on different occasions to just because we love them or just give them gifts and spend time with them, right? At the same time, love, you know, if my child is about to put his or her hand on a stove, I'm not going to, you know, let them do that. Out of my love and concern for them, I'm going to prevent them from doing something harmful. That's my job as a parent, right? The way we raise our kids. Do we raise our kids intentionally to know Jesus Christ? Do we? I'm going to encourage you guys with something. Um, The investment that you've made in your kids and that you're making in your kids is not in vain. And I know some 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 of you guys have have kids who may be not close to Jesus right now. But what you've invested in their lives over the years, it's in there, and God is using it. You don't know it, you don't know it, but He is. You know, I have my, you know, my, my kids are wonderful, and they watch my messages, so i got to be careful. <laughs> but they would say, you know, that they're, they've had struggles. They're both adults now. I have a grandchild with my daughter and her husband, and then there's and Josh. Do you know, um, and some of you guys remember Josh when he was here for a while. Josh and I have a Bible study now once a week. And if I miss it, he contacts me. We're going through the Gospel of John together. And he found a church in his neighborhood that he can get to, that he can walk to. Just a loving church. But he's, God has done something in his heart. And it's like the things that were planted really deep when I raised him. I'm starting to see the truth of those things really lived out in his life. I'm so proud of my son. He's going after Jesus. He's asking great questions. The way that we raise our kids really matters. Love has different expressions. Jesus, and thirdly, Jesus loves people through us. How does Jesus demonstrate his love for people? Often through us. We're, in the Bible, we're called the body of Christ. Have you ever thought about the implications of that metaphor that we are the body of Christ? Simply put, we are His hands reaching out to people. We are His feet going to where people are. We are His ears listening to people's hurts. We are His voice giving counsel and encouragement and even confrontation in His name. We are the body of Christ. Jesus loves people through us. He said to his disciples, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. I've loved you, now you love one another. What I've done for you, do to one another. Now we know, I know. He's talking about the church loving the church in that particular scripture, right? He's talking about the church being unified with the heart of the Father and the love of God. But there are other areas in the Bible where Jesus, um, you know, to quote him, you know, he's... He, he instructs his disciples to not just love one another, but to love others. Remember when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. Then he said, but the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. So the same love that we desire to grow in together as a church family and as a church community isn't um, 
exclusive, right? Our heart is to, that we would extend that love to those that are not a part of our family yet, but will be. Or maybe not even part of the kingdom, whether they come to Crossway Vineyard or any other church, right? We just want them to be in a family. And as a church, we want to include them. That's why we do things like the grocery outreach and reaching out to people to demonstrate the love of God, to let them know that Jesus is radically in love with them. Right? And he's given us a radical love for them. I'm going to encourage, I've been praying, guys, uh, along the lines of something. I've been praying, and this happened um, some years ago. It was another occasion. Uh, I feel like the Lord's really been pressing my heart to pray that as a church we would seek uh, to extend that we would be a church that seeks mercy. Mercy for ourselves, mercy for our family, but mercy for the folks that aren't a part of our family yet. And that can be challenging, because when you pray for mercy, your heart will be shaped, and it'll be be hard. Because some of the people that God will call you to be merciful, you don't want to be merciful, (laughs) right? Kind of like Jonah and Nineveh. I don't want to go there. Right? We all probably have either people in our family or in our circle of friendships and our network that are like anywhere but there. I've got folks like that in my life. And God's calling me to extend his mercy to them. And I'll do it when I understand more the mercy and the grace of God for me than I can walk in it. But it challenges me. But as a church, I'm praying that we would grow in mercy. We would grow in mercy. It's a divine mandate to love people with the love of Christ. Even those that we consider to be the worst of people. So you can be a good doctor and you can love your patients. You can be a good lawyer and not love your clients. You could be a good geologist and not love science, right? But you cannot be a good Christian without love. You can't be. It's what Jesus said. In Romans 5, verse 5, we're told the love of God has been shed abroad into our hearts, or it's been poured out into our hearts by the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Apostle Paul says, regularly, regularly, continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. We love the idea, but do we love it enough? We love the idea that God loves us. He loves me. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so, right? But do we love it enough? Do we love it enough to lay down our preferences in life to see the love of God invade the life of another? Do we? We have to understand that the Holy Spirit being poured out in and through our life uh, into our hearts, that we become not just a uh, a, a receptacle of His love, but we become a conduit of His love, a channel of His love, right, to others. In the early part, I don't know if you know this, of Christian history, uh, don't get me wrong, I understand the church has a really mixed, when you, if you study church history, there were some really bad, like the Crusades, we're not proud of, right? There were some really bad moments throughout uh, Christian history, particularly when, when it was governed by the government. But there were times, too, when the love of God permeated, even in those moments, though. God was still at work, right? We're a, we're, we're a church. We're, we're imperfect, but God still uses us if we're available. But in the early part of Christian history, uh, when the church was scattered throughout the Roman Empire, the last Roman Empire, the last pagan emperor, who was Julian, his, uh, Julian the Apostate, said something very intriguing about the Christians that they were persecuting. He wrote, whilst the pagan priests neglect the poor, the hated Galileans, that's what he called Christians, the Galileans, his term for Christians, the hated Galileans devote themselves to works of charity. They not only feed their own, but ours also, welcoming them with their agape, unconditional love. They attract people. They're growing in size and power because of their charity, because of their love. And this was a demonic ruler noticing this. 
The pagan emperor noted there's a huge difference between Christians and the rest of society, the rest of the citizens of the Roman Empire. And that difference was love for all people. What would culture say about the church today? Right? What would culture t- say uh, to about us? What, what are we reflecting to the world around us? Would they say, now that's a group that loves See, my hope and my prayer is that over time, over the months and years to come, that folks we're visiting in homes and praying for, we're extending the love of God, and we've got some really creative ways that we're talking about doing this, that people won't say, oh, Crossway Vineyard, now that's a really cool church. Like, they know how to love people. Like, we really like Crossway, right? What we want, my hope is that over the years, Crossway Vineyard, at some point, will probably be forgotten as a church. I mean, unless God means for us to be around forever, I don't know. But people will say, now, there's something about Jesus. Like, I don't know what that church was that visited me with groceries. Don't remember the name. Um, But I feel loved and seen by Jesus. He cares for my needs. He cares for what I'm going through. He cares for my pains and my struggles. That's our hope as a church. Not that we would make our church's name big and great, but that we would partner with the Holy Spirit in making the name of Jesus big and great to our culture, right? In our day. Are you guys with me? Well, here's what I'm going to do. Look at that. Two, one. I just wanted to play that. Now, I did get a late start. <laughs> so here's what I'm going to do, guys. Uh, we're going we're gonna to have a time of, of prayer. Um, so if you're watching this on video, we're really glad that you would do that. Um, join us next week. And if you're in Urbana, we'd love to see you.